Anyway, let me try to share um, how we think data can help improve healthcare. And, th and the key point is really <laughs> that what we don't know can hurt us. Um, the current conundrum is pretty clear. Um, rising costs are a serious threat. You don't need to hear me detail the reasons. Um, we have two major barriers to that. I think the first barrier is fear, you know, the fundamental fear of rationing, of change, and this sense that lower cost must equal lower quality. The second barrier is really about ignorance. It's about where the money is going, um, where the waste is in medicine, and the ignorance about how to do better. I'm going to try to share four quick examples of how we at Dartmouth um, have used data to try to inform the healthcare debate um, and to overcome these barriers. The four basic ideas are looking at re regional variations to help find the waste, identifying high performing systems, supporting change in clinical practice, and motivating change um, for better in the future. Um, if you look at growth in Medicare spending over the last 15 years. It's been about 3.5% on average throughout the United States. But there are many communities within the United States that have been growing at well over one percentage point below the average for the United States. In those com if everyone in the United States had adopted the gr spending growth, had achieved the spending growth of those high-performing communities, healthcare the, the Medicare trust fund would be $1.4 trillion better off over the next 15 years. So Medicare wouldn't go bankrupt, and we could continue to afford health insurance. The key insight that came from our work over the last 20 years with Jack Wenberg and others is to understand what you get when you spend more in the context of these regional variations in spending. So what does higher spending buy? With a lot of help from the Institute of Medicine and I mean from, the, from a number of foundations, National Institutes of Aging, Medicare data, um, other sources, we carried out a number of studies that showed quite convincingly that more medical care does not mean better medical care. Those who live in high cost regions actually survive shorter times after their heart attacks or hip fractures. They report worse quality. The physicians in those communities say it's harder for them to provide high quality care than similar physicians reporting on the low cost communities. Um, patients' experiences in the hospital are worse in high cost communities than low cost communities. So the data was pretty clear. Um, lower spending is compatible with better outcomes in health, better outcomes and better quality. The insight, or one of the insights, was to understand where that money is going, to use the data for that Medicare had provided us to compare these regions. And I'm just looking at the five communities that I showed you on the prior slide, running from Miami, at the highest, one of the highest spending communities in the country, to Salem, Oregon, um, one of the lowest spending communities in the country. But this data shows you, so what kind of utilization, where is that money going? If you look at the rate of avoidable admissions, you know, per thousand Medicare beneficiaries. Rates of avoidable hospitalizations are twice as high in Miami and almost twice as high in East Long Island as they are in Salem, Oregon. And these are not due to differences in health status. They see physicians almost three times as frequently in Miami as in Salem, Oregon. Imaging services, almost three times as high, again, in Miami compared to Salem. And what we learned is that the places that have the highest performance are places where, where primary care physicians predominate. So much of the current debate on health care reform and many of the reform ideas that are currently before Congress are driven by this data that shows higher performing systems have stronger primary care foundations and thus there's a lot in the current legislation that says let's strengthen the base of primary care. And finally, that last column, highly fragmented delivery systems in those um, high spending regions, much more likely to have complicated care, and that probably explains why mortality rates are higher. Let me quickly run through what we've taken from this to s show how we think it informs policy and then where we think that's likely to go. The first underlying problem that comes out of our data is this failure to recognize the role of the local healthcare system as a driver of cost. How many hospitals are built, how many physicians are hired. The consequence, the principle for reform that we've been promoting on the Hill is accountability. Foster accountability for the overall costs of care um, and for the capacity of the local delivery system. I'll spend another minute on that in a second. The second underlying problem is this is lack of support for physicians and hospitals to improve their care, um, to provide care management, to provide care coordination, to help keep people out of the hospital. Local organizational support is the, is the principle that emerges from that. How are we going to create systems 
that can support primary care physicians and specialists working together to improve quality. The public, you probably among them, believe that more is better and tend to equate less care with rationing. That can only be addressed by better information about the risks and benefits of common procedures and about the, the quality of performance in different healthcare systems. And finally, we have a payment system um, that rewards more care, that rewards hospitals for expanding, um, that rewards high margin treatments and entrepreneurial, beha entrepreneurial behavior by physicians. Um, that leads to the need for payment reform. And I'm you know, happy to say that a lot of the k these ideas are embedded in many of the pilot programs that are proposed under the current legislation. They could certainly be stronger there. If I, ha if I were the healthcare czar, I'd have a few more of those, a little stronger initiatives on those fronts. Let me move to the, the, the second topic, w which was this notion of how, what can we how can we use data to learn about high-performing systems? So in, in June, uh, four colleagues and I, Atul Gawande, myself, Mark McClellan, and Don Berwick, who runs the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, decided to uh, try to invite 10 high-performing regions of the United States to come to Washington and tell their stories. Um, we used data from the Dartmouth Atlas, looking at per capita costs, and we used Medicare data on the quality of care to identify High 70 high-performing systems, and then we invited 10 of them, sort of diverse from around the country, to come to, um, to, come to DC and tell us their stories. Um, the data tells us that these are pretty impressive places. On average, their per capita Medicare spending is substantially lower um, than all the other regions who are not high-performing. Um, they have the patients in those um, in those communities spend less time in the hospital, 1.52 days on average compared to 1.9 days. I know this is a data conference, or this is about data, so I'm sorry to bore you with some data, um, but you know, I guess I'm supposed to. Um, imaging spending, markedly different. Um, hospital quality scores, not very different, but everybody's pretty high on that, um, on the quality scores in these particular measures. Not particularly, they could be higher. But if you look at those, benchmarks, take those 10 high-performing communities and say, so how much would Medicare save? Um, and we think this is likely to extrapolate to the private sector. If all regions of the United States could practice the way those communities do, Medicare spending would fall by 16% tomorrow. Now, it's going to be hard to get them to change tomorrow. Hospital days, the amount of time average Medicare patients spend in the hospital would be declined by 17%, and the frequency of visits to specialists would decline by 40%. And from our data, outcomes would be just as good, if not better. So there's tremendous opportunity to improve the efficiency of the U.S. healthcare delivery system, and that's probably why I get to spend more time traveling around talking these days than I used to. So what we learned from this conference, we had them they come to a, a room like this, six representatives from each of these communities, tell their stories, um, a few insights into how they did it. Um, let's see if. I may not have hit the button. There's some common elements across the regions. The first was a wonderful notion, um, a focus on accountability to their communities. So the physicians, the hospital leaders, um, even the insurance companies within those communities felt a responsibility to try to improve the health, improve the care, and keep the costs reasonable within those communities. Physicians were engaged as leaders with strong support for the professional values that docs came to this work that I do, um, to, that they went to medical school for, Sh support for professional values of the best possible care for your patients. They all had a strong primary care foundation, and they used data to support their work. The way they eliminated waste in their communities was by using data. For example, Cedar Rapids looked at how frequently C CT scans of the head were performed, counted them up in the community, and said, this is outrageous. We're doing 52 CT scans for every 100 residents of our community. Um, this is outrageous. We have to intervene to do something about it. The physicians in Asheville, North Carolina had done something similar around treatment of cardiovascular disease. They used the data, they fed it back to the docs, and they watched what happened um, to change practice. And so this data feedback was a critical, a critical element of what they, were able to what they were able to do. Let me give you a couple of examples of how data feedback has been used in health systems currently um, around the country uh, to change practice. So this is an example from Intermountain Healthcare, which, which was mentioned by the president last night in his speech, um, largely based on this particular example of how they, the, the graph shows the percent of patients who have a, an elevated blood sugar level, percentage of diabetics, you want that number to be low. With careful intervention, they were able to dramatically reduce the number of patients who have diabetes out of control. 
Second example, at Partners Healthcare, Mass General, Ho Mass General Hospital in uh, Boston, um, they started a, pr a study to look at the frequency with which physicians ordered electrocardiograms. Now, you know, we go into our offices, we see a patient, we order a test, we have no idea how we're doing compared to the other physicians in the next office. What they found that is across the, across the primary care physicians working at one of America's best hospital, there was a, one physician who was ordering no electrocardiograms. That's probably too low a rate, right? But there was, an, there was another physician who was ordering one for every four patients they saw. That rate's probably not right either. And when they looked at the practice level, there were still these huge, the 10 different office practice sites that they had, there were still these huge variations. They developed an intervention to say, well, when should we order electrocardiograms? They'd never talked about it. Never since training, none of the docs had ever managed to discuss when, when it's reasonable to order an electrocardiogram. And they both re markedly reduced the variability and reduced the frequency of this, you know, unnecessary and reasonably expensive test. Third example, and this is what they're doing now. This is, this is each of those vertical bars represents at partners one of, the, one of the physicians in the primary care practice. The vertical bar represents how frequently they order very expensive advanced imaging studies, such as an MRI scan or a CT scan um, or a nuclear imaging study. So there are five-fold differences across the primary care physicians at Partners Healthcare in the frequency with which they order this extremely expensive test, and in the case of CT scanning, a test that has the radiation equivalent of 400 chest X-rays. If they disagree to this amount, you know, this says we have an opportunity both to improve practice, and they've been using this data to improve their decision-making around when to provide the treatment, but also to reduce the provision of unnecessary treatment while improving the provision of needed and, and, and important care. So let me turn to the last bit of this, um, which is, you know, I don't know how many of you read Atul Gawande's piece in, in The New Yorker about McAllen, Texas and El Paso, the cost conundrum. Um, but what we had discovered about last summer when we started to look at the data carefully, McAllen and El Paso, both border communities, had been spending exactly the same amount per capita back in 1992. Same spending on Medicare beneficiaries. And yet McAllen became the highest growth in per capita spending region in the country and is now second only to Miami um, in terms of per capita costs on Medicare spending. And we gave the, we, we, a quick phone call to Atul Gawande to say, hey, Atul, if you're interested in talking about healthcare costs, maybe there's a story here. So he went off um, and, as those of you who've read the story are aware, found a culture of entrepreneurial behavior um, in McAllen with lots of hospital expansion, lots of physicians making lots of money. M the McAllen physicians were not exactly happy um, when Atul published his article. And when it was read even that weekend by the president and, and McAllen started to be plastered all over um, the United States. But something has happened. What happened was after that, the physicians from McAllen um, have now gone to visit Grand Junction, Colorado, which was the other community that was highlighted, which is a very low cost, high quality community. So the opportunities from using this kind of data to bring communities together, your communities or other communities around the country, to try to motivate change um, and to get people engaged in looking at their data and improving the care within their communities, I think is quite stunning. I'll just end with one last little aside about the challenges El Paso faces as it tries to make some changes. They went to visit Grand Junction, but they had a terrible time finding a landing strip for their private jets on their way <laughs> to Grand Junction. And the family practitioners in Grand Junction who'd never heard of physicians owning jets um, thought this may be a clash of cultures that would have um, some challenges coming together. Why, I'll stop there. Why we have time, we about three minutes for some questions. And I'm happy to answer questions about the data, how we use the data, what kind of data communities can have, um, see if wake this audience up. You guys had just had a break. Michael Pollan has an article in the New York Times this morning about the uh, coming clash of the agricultural industry and the healthcare industry and the fact that if and when the insurance companies take responsibility for managing costs, they will become lobbyists against big food. When will we start to see the data from the healthcare community supporting the need to change our agricultural policies? Oh, what a great question. Well, the first thing we have to do, the first thing we have to do is get communities engaged in, in improving the health of their communities. 
and we have a project going in, in New Hampshire and Vermont right now, which is actually trying to support a community collaborative focused on improving population health with health data using some of the kinds of technologies that you've heard about, you've heard about at this conference. I think once it's transparent to a community um, that the burden of obesity and the burden of ill health that comes from, um, much of it comes from the way we eat and the way we don't walk, um, we will start to have some conversations about sustainable gardens, about grocery stores in downtown urban areas, and I think that conversation is coming. But it's data, I believe data is going to drive it when we make it transparent to people how pathetic, it's not quite the right technical term, is it? Um, <laughs> how challenged we are um, to improve health um, in this particular, and get us aligned on health. Energy is the same thing. You know, we need to be walking and, and, and not driving our cars. So a sustainable agriculture, sustainable energy, and sustainable health care should all be aligned, and I, I think data can change it. One more question. Uh, hi. Yes. One of the things that's apparent when you, when you graph out the different communities is that there are many communities where there's not a correlation between, you know, large metro areas, high-income metro areas, and the cost of healthcare, but it does look like there's some correlation. Can you address that? Absolutely. Well, academic medical centers generally like to locate themselves in large urban areas, and many physicians prefer to live in large urban areas. But in our day, you know, first, so when you look, most of the research we've done has accounted for those differences. So when you look at urban areas that are very similar on multiple dimensions, you still see twofold differences in per capita spending. Um, and twofold differences in utilization. You can look across rural areas and see differences that are, that are just as great, high cost, high intensity rural communities and low cost, um, low intensity rural communities where the outcomes are just as good. I think that you know, we know that we need good data um, to measure and adjust appropriately for differences so we don't penalize urban providers for the disadvantaged populations they're caring for. Those of you who are interested can go to the New England Journal website where we posted last night um, an article that looks, or where they posted kindly ahead of time to help, you know, with the current debate about exactly this question, um, where the academic medical centers are trying to push back and say, don't touch us, please. Um, and we say, no, 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 there's lots of variation among academic medical centers, and you guys should be responsible for helping solve the problem as much as create the problem. Um, I hope that addresses the question. It's been a treat to be with you. Um, good luck, and go back to your communities and use data to transform the system. <laughs>